is fuel for your body, your mind, and definitely your sport. But let's face it, nutrition is confusing and the expectations on girls and women to be thin and have a six pack are exhausting. If you've ever been frustrated with your body, confused about nutrition, obsessed with eating healthy or guilty when you don't, under ate, over ate, or overtrained, and overwhelmed with all the pressure, then this podcast is for you. Nutrition can be easy, you can take control of it, but it might start with letting go of control by asking for help and making a change. I'm Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, sports dietitian and owner of Rise Up Nutrition, where I empower female athletes to overcome nutrition concerns and perform at their highest level, to stop being confused by all the mixed or harmful messages, and finally have confidence in your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. All right, fans, I have a great guest with us here today, Brody Sharp. He is a running physiotherapist from Melbourne, Australia. He graduated from physiotherapy in 2012, and he has a huge passion for working specifically with runners. Brody is on a mission to bring clear, evidence-based information to runners in order for them to train smarter, reduce the risk of injury, and increase their performance safely. Brody is the host of his own podcast, a really good one we're fans of here. It's called Run Smarter Podcast, and he is the owner of Run Smarter Physiotherapy Clinic, which is based in Australia, but we'll we'll get into this as we chat with him. He supports people, I think, all across the globe. So Brody, welcome to the Female Athlete Nutrition Podcast. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, we needed some male energy in the yeah. podcast. So Good. it's about Happy time. to bring some male energy. Yes. And hopefully <laughs> a lot of um, educational content as well. Oh, I know for sure you will. Yeah. So actually I'm going to kick this off with on, on your website, you have that like free quiz to ah. uh, s- test your knowledge about injuries. Mm. And I did not do as good as I thought I would do. I think I got 19 out of 36. Okay. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of tricky <laughs> questions in there. I make it, I design it to be very tricky. And so 19 um, is very good. Oh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> well, also some of them are, yeah, th- some of them kind of like trick you a little bit, but I thought like, I thought that would be awesome to kind of dive into because, you know, so much of your work is to get, like you, like I just mentioned, evidence-based information, um, really science, bring the science to people. And so I thought we could start with kind of busting some myths or some things that people get wrong. Maybe some of the things I got wrong on your free quiz online. Yeah. <laughs> you want to dive into it? Sure. So um, a lot of the questions that are on that quiz are around like what causes injury, what causes pain, a lot of questions about pain science. And they're, they're some of my big passions because a lot of them are misconceptions. A lot of them, people just get really confused and it's not their fault either because they like runners, they go in search for answers to help their injuries or why am I getting injured? And these are the misconceptions that they find. It's the most prominent when you search on Google, these are the answers that come up, but the science will not only show it's not true, but in certain instances, the it's contradictory to the fact. And so you might find that some some websites saying you're getting injured because maybe you need to stretch more or people saying that you're getting injured because you have flat feet or some people saying that it's due to certain biomechanics in your running when often, more often than not, it's not the case. And so, yeah, I I guess that's one idea for me to create this quiz just to see how people go where their, their knowledge is. And it's right up the alley of the Run Smarter podcast because we're helping athletes were helping runners to train smarter. And in order to train smarter, we need the right education. And so I guess, do you want me to delve deep into one um, myth specifically? Because I can definitely do that. Yeah, I, I wrote down a few. Okay. <laughs> that, and one thing you already just said of like flat feet, flat feet caused increased risk of injury. And I feel like that's something like you just always hear. And that was one of those questions that I was like, well, maybe it doesn't then, but you hear that all the time. Of course. Yep. That's, that's why I'm on this mission and that's why there's so much confusion. And it's a very, very common experience for a runner to walk into a shoe store wanting to buy new running shoes. And the sales assistant or someone working there will say, okay, let's have a look at the shape of your foot. 
and let's maybe get you walking on that sort of pressure scan where they have a look at what where the where you're placing pressure on your foot and what the shape of your foot is based on your arch height and then based on that sort of data they say okay well these shoes uh, will be best for you. They say, okay, you have flat feet, so you need more support. You have high feet, so you might need orthotics or something. And then they sort of assign a whole bunch of shoes based on just the foot shape, which there's no evidence to show any correlation between you surviving or thriving in a type of shoe based on your foot shape. And there's actually like studies where they follow a whole bunch of groups and they allocate them to certain foot shapes. So they have the highly supinated, which is a very high arch, then the supinated, then the neutral, uh, the neutral feet. Then they have the pronated, which is kind of like a flat foot, and then over pronated, which is even flatter than that. And they all put them in a neutral shoe and just let them do their running. They measure their, they document their miles, and they see how long until they get injured. And a lot of these runners, like they make sure they have the same baseline characteristics with age and running mileage and like fitness levels and those sort of things. And then they find that they all get injured at the same rate. And they find that even the ones who are pronators, they actually get injured slightly less than the neutrals and the supinated. And they're all in neutral shoes. So they don't have the support that people think that they require. And so I guess it's worth mentioning or worth educating people to start with about why runners actually get injured and what's the For what's sure. the main cause because a lot of these myths will tie back into this whole um, idea. And so runners get injured when there's an abrupt change in their training. And so we call this like an overload or we call this a training error. And if you think about your body, you think about all the different bones, ligaments, joints, muscles, tendons, everything that's in your body, it has a certain load capacity. It has a certain threshold that if you surpass that threshold, it will start breaking down rather than building up. And what we want to do in training is we want to know where that threshold is and train just below that because just below that is what we call your adaptation zone. It's if you train enough within that adaptation zone, your body actually gets stronger and that threshold actually starts to increase. And so, what we do with uh, abrupt changes in training, most people will recognize like either a bump in mileage or an increased speed too quickly. So that's just a very, um, most people can recognize that external force of just too much loading. I've overloaded things. I've gone from running 20 miles per week to 40 miles per week training for a marathon and now I'm injured. But there's also some subtleties in the abrupt changes that people might not recognize one of them being maybe a change in footwear. So if you are used to wearing supportive shoes and then you go for, to wear a minimalist shoe with less support, it's still okay for you to make that transition, but it needs to be extremely gradual. But if it's too abrupt and that transition is too abrupt, it's putting more load on your foot, it's putting more load on your fascia, on your Achilles, on your calf, and then it increases the likelihood if the transition isn't safe enough to an injury. Other ch abrupt changes in training would be things like terrain. So you're used to running on flats and then all of a sudden you're doing hills. If you're used to running on road and all of a sudden you're on trails, those sort of abrupt changes, there could be an under recovery aspect. So you're keeping your mileage exactly the same, but all of a sudden you're getting a lack of sleep, you're getting increased stress, your um, nutrition's a bit poor. So it's not more of a over training per se, but it's an under recovering, which you still get overloaded by under recovering. Um, and so there's there's shifts within your your routine that you might not think is a training error, which in fact it is. And it takes a little bit of delving into delve a little bit deeper to try and find these changes in training. Because I see some runners who are injured, and they say I just haven't changed anything, and then you delve a bit deeper, and they're like, oh, actually, I'm doing things slightly longer. I'm waking up half an hour earlier to go for my long run. And I've also, you know, changed my routine around how I, how I run. I've changed my shoes a little bit and you just start to find a few things you're like, okay, maybe you've overloaded the tissue slightly in one area and that's why you're injured. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So not having those abrupt changes, probably also not changing too many things at once. Like if you start a new job, you wake up 30 minutes earlier and you change your shoes. Like they seem so little, but those things really add up. Absolutely. Yeah. It's all about doing things 
safely. It's all about having the right parameters and then just slowly building upon that. That's everyone knows like a, a marathon training plan where you run a very low amount and then week by week you slightly increase that with a deload week here and there. But the idea is just to slowly build you up and so the body adapts and gets stronger. And we we supposed to, like if you want to get faster, stronger, fitter, you want to chase that adaptation zone. So you can't just keep to running 40 miles a week every single week and expect to improve because your body's going to want a different response. It's going to want a more challenging stimulus. And so that's why we need to work within our adaptation zone, but then slowly build upon that. And I don't know if this is something you can go into more in depth or if it's really like an individualized thing, but you mentioned how you really want to train just below that adaptation zone and not overload it. How, how the heck do you know when you're just below it? Like, how do you, that's something you can measure? Yeah. So we want to train slightly below the injury threshold, not necessarily below your adaptation zone. We want to train within your adaptation zone, but just above that adaptation zone is your risk of injury. And so slightly above that adaptation zone might be like a 10% chance of injury or a 1% chance of injury. But if you go even more beyond that, then it's like a 20% chance of injury or a 50% chance of injury. And so that's where, yeah, exactly. How do we find it? It's this arbitrary number that we can't exactly calculate. But what you can do as an athlete is find your ad know where your adaptation zone is like because of my training being quite methodical i kind of know what my mileage is per week and what i can currently handle i know my current intensities what intensities i'm working at so most people will know kind of like their baseline we can kind of even if you're underloading yourself we kind of know where that is and then the idea is to almost underload yourself to start with if you're a bit unsure and then build up from there very slowly very methodically and eventually even if you start off underloading yourself, you're going to hit your adaptation zone quite quickly if you build up week by week. So you eventually get there and then it's just building upon that. But I do say a lot with my runners. I do say a lot with runners who ask me a lot of questions. It's all a trial and error. It's all like just putting on your scientific cap and just treating something as an experiment. So if you're not sure where you are, maybe you say, let me start off quite conservative. Let me run 20 minutes, four times a week. Uh, at this like low intensity, let me see how I feel afterwards. Let me see how my body's responding. Let me see if I'm feeling fresh. Let me see if there's tightness occurring or like a couple of sore spots here and then. Let me just evaluate the end of the week. And then if that's all fine, okay, let me keep my intensity the same, but let me increase by five minutes every day or something like that. It's starting conservative and then slowly building yourself up. That way you don't need to try and find where that injury line is. You just slowly build up from a conservative standpoint. Yeah. Which is probably a very hard thing for most people to do and something that you're probably always like reeling people in on. People always want to, you know, go hard and go fast and and just, you know. That's why runners are injured. That's why runners are injured all the time. And that's why whenever I talk to runners, they say, yeah, I've had a hamstring issue. I've had a calf issue. I've had an Achilles issue for the last three years. And Running's a dangerous sport. Like there's studies on this. There's anywhere between 50 to 80% of runners are injured within a given year. It is the most dangerous sport you can come up with. And so you don't have sporting athletes getting injured that often. And it's only because no. runners, they're very self-driven. They're self-motivated. They're, they want to, you know, have a marathon goal and then train for that. But as soon as that marathon's done, they're looking to do another marathon in a better time or they're looking to do an ultra marathon or they're just like there's just another goal another goal and they're very ambitious goals and if there's likely to be like a a sore spot they're going to run through it if they're under recovering if they're not sleeping too well they're still going to run and so they're very driven very motivated and it increases the likelihood of us flirting with that injury line above that adaptation zone and so that's why a lot of these runners are breaking down yeah, 50 to 80% of runners get injured within a year. That's that's insane, but I believe it. And I think I would assume that another reason for that is a lot of people like assume anybody can run, you know, like it, like I might not just go out and play a pickup game of basketball because I don't have any friends that play basketball and I don't have a hoop around, but like I can put on shoes and go run. But so then there's a lot of people just doing it without maybe proper form or the knowledge on on how to do that right? On how to properly run. Is that probably another reason? Yeah. And the 
the nature of running is limitless as well. There's no ceiling. Like if you use, say, basketball as an example, you play a game of basketball for 40 minutes. No matter how intense it may be, you may increase the intensity of that game, but it's always only ever going to be 40 minutes. People don't play an intense game of 40 minutes and then say, oh, let me see how I go to do 60 minutes next time. Oh, let me see how I go to do 120 minutes next time. And running is exactly that. Running is just finding this limitless activity where you're just testing yourself. You're constantly pushing your body. There's a lot of load going through your body. People don't really recognize that every single step that you take is two to three times your body weight in force through your knees, through your hips. Uh, When it comes to the feet, certain structures of the feet, up to eight times your body weight every single step that you take. So the amount of force generation per step is enormous. And so if you that's why that if you go from 40 miles a week to 60 miles a week or like this huge change, that's why tissues break down because you're like, I've had enough of this. This is way too much. I can't, I can't handle it. And so that's why we break down and that's why we get injured. And it's this limitless thing that runners seem to do. They train for a 5K, they train for a 10K, they go for a half marathon, then they do a marathon and then they just continue pushing themselves. Oh, let me go for three marathons in three months. It's like yeah, it's insane. And so a lot of the injured runners that I see, they're injured, they haven't ran pain-free for several weeks and you finally work with them to get a plan on board, you get them strength training, you do all these rehab stuff and then they're finally running pain-free and they've only been running pain-free for like a week and they say, Brody, there's a marathon in three months' time. I know I just wanted to get back to pain-free running but like my friends are doing it, can I do it? And I'm like, this is why you're injured in the first place because you have these ambitious goals in three months. You know we're near training for that in three months. If you do that, you're going to break down and it's just the desire. It's the the passion that runners have, which I love the running passion. I love that they are so dedicated to being fit and being healthy and being like internally driven. But we also need to be sensible and we need to train smarter. That's why it's so dangerous and that's why runners need to be educated on these things as much as we can. Yeah, such an interesting perspective because I think, you know, myself, my friends, people I've talked to on this podcast who are runners and we say things like, I want to find my limit, you know, but it's like the way you just phrase that is like, that's the issue with the sport. It's limitless. And you're just going to, your limit is going to be just your injuries and how much you crush and hurt your body. And that's not really a good thing. So it's such an interesting perspective of thinking about it that way, that running is one of the most dangerous sports. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that before, but the way that you are expressing this, it makes complete sense. Yeah. And when I try and convince my runners to talk about strength training, like they should be strength training twice a week, they, some of someone's worry, uh, I try and allay their fears, but some people are worried that if they go into the gym, they start doing squats, deadlifts, calf raises, that they're going to get injured. And I'm like, running is the one that's going to get you injured. No, like hardly anyone gets injured at the gym if they do things safely, if they do it with the correct technique and they are within their adaptation zone. Like that just doesn't happen. But running, you get injured all the time. So you're doing the most dangerous sport in the world and then you're worried about being injured when you're at the gym. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. So Brody, I'm interested to know more about you personally. I mean, do you run? Have you experienced all these running injuries? Um, Like you have so much passion for runners specifically. Yeah. So I, so I'm a physiotherapist by trade, which is the same as a physical therapist in the U S. And so uh, I graduated in 2012 and I was playing basketball at that stage and not really much of a runner. I only just ran playing basketball, but once I gave up that that career, I uh, my sister was training for a half marathon at that time and asked if I wanted to train with her um, because she wanted some accountability and it'd be kind of fun if we're doing it together. And so I agreed, um, started training, started doing some running stuff. I didn't know much about the science of running at that stage. I was a generic physio that like just knew kind of like the basics, but I quickly caught the running bug and I could very quickly had this passion as soon as like a a runner would come into my clinic and I I get to treat this runner, I'd just be buzzing and wanting to talk about their running shoes and their cadence and their running form and their running goals. And I had this passion to get them back to pain-free running, but I was constantly educating them during my sessions around cadence, around injury prevention, around like just myths. Once I became a runner myself, I delved deep into a lot of the research because I was getting injured myself all the time. And I'm like, why is this happening? Like I 
constantly, oh, well, my first injury was knee pain. Then I had some mild like calf issues. Then I had this hip issue and I was just like, man, this is tough. And so, yeah, I just wanted to spend more time around this running population because it it brought on my energy. It didn't really deplete my energy. If I was seeing runners all day, I'd just be buzzing at like the highest energy level possible. But there are uh, there were other people like we say chronic low back pain that didn't want to listen to me. They just wanted a massage and that was it. They were like yeah. depleting my energy. And if I spent my, enough time around that population, I was getting home after work kind of a bit drained. But I recognize the population that like increased my energy rather than depleting my energy. I'm like, let me spend so much time around this population. And so... Over the years, I've transitioned out of that and now I'm a physiotherapist that only treats runners, only works with runners and hence the the podcast is the one way to educate runners because when I was treating runners, I, I was stunned to know like a lot of these myths, like people think that they're just getting injured because they don't stretch enough or people think that they're getting injured because they have flat feet and they need orthotics for life and I was just constantly educating, educating. I'm like, I need to kind of build like a resource around helping runners. And so the kind of like the social media stuff, like the Instagram, uh, I'm quite active on that. And the podcast and the website and the blogs and those sort of things is just my attempt to help bring clarity to to runners, help bring control to their training and control to overcoming their injuries. And so, yeah, that's where that's what led me to where I'm at today. Yeah, I love it. And we'll be sure to include all your links and everything in our show notes for the 50 to 80% of runners that get injured to make sure you follow follow along with Brody and all of his amazing resources that he has. Yeah, and definitely working with people that that, you know, excite you instead of drain you makes yeah, makes sense for any job. I'm curious to know since this is the female athlete nutrition podcast, are there any injuries that you see more common in women? versus men like I like my little my tiny tiny bit of knowledge is like women often have a different cue angle with their hips and their knees and maybe that causes more injuries are are there differences in the sexes there are differences and there will be studies to show that certain injuries are more common in the the female population compared to males and yet the cue angle is a a good example of why there's different loads that go through your body at different angles at different positions and so your cue angle because females have wider hips and when you run it's a one-legged kind of moving from one leg to the other that one leg when it hits the ground it's more underneath your center of, of mass more underneath the center because you want to stay balanced and so because you have wider hips the foot that is underneath your body is curving at like a steeper angle because you're starting from a wider kind of triangle and what what that means is if there is a more aggressive angle, there's increased kind of load going through the, st- the structures on the outside of the hip, but also the knee is affected quite a lot as well. And the knee is this joint in between the hip and between the foot. The foot makes contact with the ground. All the control and stability and force are produced around the hips. And the knee is kind of just this uh, joint in the middle that cops the brunt of like all these different angles. It's kind of the the um, effects are kind of amplified by what's happening at the hip because it's happening a, a bit further away down at the knee. And so if you have this wider Q angle, which all females have, um, it's just changing the loads differently around the hip, around the knee. And so when we're talking about running injuries and we're talking about training errors, when it comes to a training error, if a, a training error is present and this runner does have a higher Q angle, which the hips and the knee joints are more susceptible to high loads anyway. Once that training error happens, where does that injury arise? It's more likely to be around the outside of the hip, sometimes the ITB, sometimes the the kneecap kind of region. And so usually you'd find, and the research would support this as well, female athletes tend to get lateral hip pain. So that would be like a glute med a glute medius tendinopathy, or maybe a hip bursitis. Um, sometimes if the the training errors are present, patellofemoral pain is quite common, which is just pain around the kneecap, which is kind of hard to, to locate. It's kind of just around like some borders of the, the kneecap and also ITB syndrome, which is pain on the outside of the knee. And so Yes, females are more susceptible to those type of injuries, but if you train accordingly and we do what we discussed before around finding your adaptation zone and working your way through that, then 
you won't break down, you won't get injured. But if that training error is present, those are the areas that are most likely to be overloaded first or more susceptible to that overload. And therefore the injuries will exist in those locations. And if we compare that to say a runner, uh, let's say a 50 year old marathoner male um, who's overloaded, who's done an overload, they're more likely to get say a calf injury because of their decreased amount of um, stiffness in their tendons, in their Achilles, in their calf. There's um, they slowly, as the decades go on, they lose power and they lose strength in their calf complex. And so, if there's a training error present, it's less likely to be around the knee. It's less likely to be around the hip for that individual. It's more likely going to be around the calf Achilles region. So, a training error still needs to be present. But when that training error occurs, it's like, okay, where is this injury going to arise? And that will depend certainly on um, biomechanics or the athlete and their past kind of strength training that they've had and, yeah, their their biomechanics as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like I can relate to that personally and other, you know, clients of mine, girlfriends of mine throughout the year that the the glutes, glute meads, hips, IT band, those are pretty common. Like you said, it doesn't mean that just we're, we're doomed. It's There has to be a training error present. And I found personally, I've always enjoyed strength training, but that's done me wonders with things like those glute issues and things like that. So you you speak really highly of strength training for runners that has to be incorporated to help with injury prevention, right? For sure. And if you're if we use that athlete, uh, if we use the female athlete as an example, and we know that the hips and we know that the ITB and we know the knees are kind of susceptible if a training error is present, it makes sense that if we're in the gym, we can use the gym to build up the capacity of those structures so that they're a little bit more resilient. They're a little bit more, um, they're kind of your strongest points rather than your weakest links. They're your strongest link for when you have to do when you have to increase the load of your running and they're just unshakable. You, the, that capacity, that injury line, that injury zone that we're talking about before is way above that of the calf or the Achilles and it makes you a, a better all round runner. And so why wouldn't you do that? It just makes sense. It's just increasing your running resiliency. It's strengthening up all your weak links. And that's why we encourage strength training as much as possible. It just makes you a more unshakable, more resilient runner. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I feel like over the years, like every time I get in the gym, probably my first 20 minutes are targeting, you know, what are my problematic areas. And it's funny when I go to the gym with my husband, too, because he does the same thing. But his problem areas are his shoulders and mine are always, you know, the hips and the glutes and the, and the legs. And that's the first 20 minutes of any strength training session is is completely targeting our problem areas, mobility and, and certain like work there. And then we get into it. So it, it is, it's just interesting. It's, that's probably less of a gender thing and more of a, um, more of a, what do we do thing? I'm a runner and he does a lot of bench press. So, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's so important to target those areas that you might be prone to. So, you know, another thing, Brody, that we on this podcast and in my business, we talk about a lot is just the importance of proper nutrition and fueling, obviously, as a dietitian. And I think there's a lot to be said for how nutrition can impact, you know, your risk of injury. Like you were talking about what is your you know, there has to be a training error. And what you said earlier in the podcast is it's those abrupt changes in your training or in your lifestyle that can create injury. And I have just got to say, I think this is the same thing with nutrition and what can lead us to injury as well. You know, you, a person whose training plan is exactly the same, but then abruptly makes a drastic change in their diet might be at a higher risk of injury, especially if we're talking about an abrupt change in a diet, like doing low energy or low calorie or low carb or something like that, or even an abrupt change, like out of nowhere, you know, just going vegan and having, you know, for somebody who previously had a mixed um, diet with animal proteins and then suddenly goes vegan or vegetarian and abruptly you're getting different nutrients in your system. And that's a huge, you know, change and can affect your your overall health and your injury risk as well. Do you see this in your clinic at all? And, you know, I know your focus, of course, you're not the dietitian in this situation, but I'm sure you see this happen. 
Yeah, I, I think I'd be stepping out of my lane if I talk about the like nutritional advice, which I don't know much about the evidence of it, but there is some to say about when we're talking about the overtraining, but also the under recovering as well. It's important to know that when someone is going through these training through say like a marathon training, we don't get stronger when we're running. We get stronger when we've ran and then we're recovering afterwards. So everyone needs that recovery phase in order to get stronger. That's when the body assesses itself, reassesses and said, all right, I've gone through this load the last like 12 hours. What was that load like for me? And do I, how do I adapt to it? How do I get stronger? How do I recover from it? And that's why sometimes people are a little bit sore after an exercise, just the body kind of recalibrating and recovering from that bout of exercise. And so recognizing the importance of that recovery phase, yes, nutrition is definitely our fuel for when we exercise, but it's also our building blocks for when we're in that recovery phase as well. And the same goes with sleep. Sleep is the best recovery tool you'll have, but the hydration and nutrition is still a very important component of that. And so if you are having a huge change in your diet, I'm not sure about the specific diets, but it makes sense to me in my mind if you maybe are under fueling your your body for recovery and you're you're not giving yourself those building blocks that you once had. You could be training sensibly, you could be increasing your load sensibly and doing that adaptation zone, but you may be breaking down or you may be under recovering getting these overload issues if those building blocks nutritionally aren't there. And so that's kind of where my mind goes when you're talking about those scenarios around like a change in a change in nutritional intake and the increased likelihood of injury. Yeah. Beautifully said. You did not step outside your your scope or your lane there. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've had practice. That's what I, yeah, yeah, because that's what I see, right? You know, a lot of people come to me with their nutrition problems. And, you know, a lot of my clients are currently going through injuries or multiple repeated injuries, too. And there can be a lot, you know, yeah, it might be your training and your form and, and not doing the strength training that you're supposed to. And, um, you know, the clients I see, it's often that abrupt change in their diet and their nutrition that wasn't the best choice for them. So I'm just kind of drawing parallels that I think just like with training, you were saying, you know, you know, kind of being more conservative and building up, I would say same thing with your nutrition, even if there are changes you need to make, whatever that might be, to do so conservatively, instead of that abrupt change, um, because that is where we see see that your body isn't recovering if it's not getting the nourishment that it needs. I love I love that you said that, you know, your training isn't just your your exercise. It's the recovery period that's really getting you faster and stronger. And um, that's something we just really, really, really need to focus on with our training, taking care of our bodies, our sleep and our nutrition is it's not about the one hour run. It's about the 23 other hours of the day. Yeah, sometimes. totally agree. Mm hmm. Yeah. So you had another question on your quiz that um, I thought was really interesting and I have no clue if I got it right. I think I got it right. But then I then I was like, Brody, I don't know what you're doing to me. I'm uh -huh. getting confused. It was it was just a true or false. Like the body will tell the brain when it's in pain. And I, I I'm assuming, yes, I'm always somebody who's like, listen to your body, listen to your body. But I was super curious to hear that side of things of just like listening to your body and and what is a good amount of pain and what type of pain means injury, stop, rest. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I think like since since learning about running injuries and probably in the last couple of years, I think pain science has been one of my fascinations and I've just stumbled into like interviewing pain psychologists, pain scientists, reading up on pain books and this whole topic. Like I I do episodes and I've been appeared as a guest on other podcasts just purely just talking about pain the entire time and it's extremely fascinating in my mind. And so this is one of these tricky questions because yes, the body parts will tell the brain when they are in pain sometimes, but not necessarily. There's certain instances where those messages get mixed up and sometimes you can have pain in your hand, but nothing actually be structurally going on. There may be like mixed messages there. And when it comes to pain, if we're, if we're to talk about this topic, like briefly, it's that people need to recognize that all pain is generated from the brain. It's not actually the body parts themselves. And we know that all pain is generated from the brain because there are certain examples where there is nothing going on 
in the tissue, in the body, but people still experience like chronic like pain and very severe pain and nothing's going on. All that all that's happening is the brain thinks something's going on. And so that could be context like people hear stories about like a mugging where someone's shot or stabbed or something and they don't feel a thing because they didn't notice it going on and they think the relevance of that is extremely low because they need to get away from that danger quickly and so it's not till later on that someone says hey you've you've there's a knife sticking out of your back and then all the pain comes in later on and it's because the brain evaluates everything that goes on it evaluates um, the situation it evaluates your past experiences it evaluates the context and then decides what's going to happen. Do I produce pain? Do I not produce pain? Is it something that's happening later? If I do produce pain, at what level? Should it just be mild? Should it just be severe? And so we almost, the brain can sometimes get tricked or get confused as to when it does send those pain messages. And we know phantom limb pain is another phenomenon that's um, very interesting yeah. with pain science. So we have amputees who have been amputated from the knee down. They still get pain in their foot that's currently, well, it's not there anymore. They get pain in their big toe and they know there's like, I have pain in my big toe where my big toe once was, but doesn't make any sense because it's not there anymore. And it's only once we know the the science around the brain and how it produces pain that makes total sense because nothing in the brain has changed. All that's changed is the peripheral limbs. And that's how we know that all this pain is generated from the brain. There's tons of examples. And so when we say the question of, okay, so the tissues in the body illustrate a pain or strike a pain and therefore the brain knows that the body's in pain and that happens. It's actually the the reverse. It's the brain evaluates, it sees something happening and then we'll say, should I produce pain or should I not produce pain? The the tissues can provide like a sensory input where it can detect pain, uh, it can de- detect pressure, it can detect like a kind of like chemical reactions uh, or heat. They're, they're the only three senses that it can produce. You can tell if something's hot or cold, you can tell if something's sharp or dull, and you can tell if something's being squashed or not being squashed. Those are the only sensations that are produced. And We've also got like, you can see things, you can see that you're cut or you can see that there's like bruising or swelling. Like, so you've got your visual component that the brain also assesses and it just compiles a whole bunch of these things. Context is huge in this uh, space as well as past experiences. So if we're using the example for a runner, if someone has had proximal hamstring tendinopathy, um, if they're starting to get proximal hamstring tendinopathy, which is the tendon that attaches onto your sitting bone, And they know that they have a friend who also has had this exact same injury and they've been managing that injury for several years and it hasn't got any better and sitting's an issue. They can't work because they can't sit. They can't like go out to the movies. They can't sit at dinner with their family. It's becoming a big stress in their life. That person who now has proximal hamstring tendinopathy, the brain is going to ramp up this pain and say, we need to, this is a big issue. We need to really overcome this and it uses context and it uses past experiences as a, a bit of data that will uh, evaluate this situation and produce pain accordingly compared to someone else who has had proximal hamstring tendinopathy for a week and they don't know what it is, they don't, they don't know who they should ask and then they come to a running physio who clearly explains why it's happened, clearly explains what the progression of uh, the rehab is, exactly what they need to do and how they need to overcome it. The brain's a lot more calm. The brain's like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. And the pain that's produced is corresponding of that. Does that make sense? It does. It's just so fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> like, this is why I've delved into this uh, this episode of oh, this fascination of um, pain science because once I learn about it, I just it just makes a whole ton of sense. It makes a ton of sense of my past injuries, the, the yeah. pain I experience now, I kind of – Every little pain experience that I that I have, I kind of assess what's going on. I kind of recognize what's going on and it makes a whole ton more sense. Yeah, it's extremely fascinating. Yeah. Oh my gosh, the power of, of the brain. It, Yeah, it's just really fascinating. I don't even have like a follow-up question because I'm just thinking about everything you said and processing it. But the fact that just like the mind-blowing fact that pain is is a message from your brain, right? And it's like, 
we can't oversimplify it to say that's good or bad, but I can see in some ways how powerful that is. And that's why things like meditation and visualization and mantras and the power of the mind can help you overcome what could be a really painful or traumatic experience. And like, you're like, no, I'm good. And that that's that's so amazing. But also I can see like the downside of it. Like you said, like there's a knife in my back and I don't even know it. Like that's not, that's not a good thing. Right. So there's times when bringing this back to running specifically, I think there's times when people really do push through an injury because they're not perceiving it as pain and maybe that's not good for their health. And then there's the flip side of people who are able to really push through, you know, in a really hard race or really hard workout or whatever it might be because of the power of the mind. You know, there's two sides to this for sure. Yeah. And there's also the side that I'm constantly working with, which is people who have had an injury for several years, like they, they've been in pain, they've had knee pain or they've had chin splints or they've had ITB issues for several years and haven't managed to get back to pain-free running yet. And this is where the realm of chronic pain comes into it. And we know that, okay, the the tissues of the body, they heal within a couple of weeks, a couple of months at most, but pain persists for years. So what what's happening there? And that's where we need to really understand the science, the the pain science of things and understand chronic pain because those pain messages are being mixed and they might not be in danger, but the brain thinks you're in danger because of context and because of past experiences. And so that's how we really need to educate people. That's how we really need to do things like mindfulness and breathing. And, you know, with any sort of chronic pain, if someone has a chronic pain syndrome, uh, mindfulness and breathing and calming down the nervous system, all those sort of uh, interventions are definitely in play. And me as a therapist needs to talk about, okay, the right education, making sure we're interpreting pain signals accordingly. Because sometimes if someone's had chronic pain, they can push in through pain. Sometimes pain's okay. It might be um, the brain saying, no, don't do it. But we know it's safe for the tissues. And so definitely in the chronic side of things, the pain messages can be extremely mixed and extremely confusing and sometimes contradictory. But in the acute stage, if someone rolls an ankle or if someone runs 50 miles a week when they're used to running 20 and all of a sudden they're, they're in a lot of pain, those pain signals can be extremely accurate. We need to really pay attention to those pain signals. But the chronic side of things, we almost need to do the opposite. So that's where it can really get quite tricky. Yeah, no, that's fascinating too. And quite a touchy subject, I'm sure too, when you start dealing with people who've been dealing with chronic pain for so long and to try and and get them to think about their pain in a different way because the brain is per- like even just labeling even just labeling it as chronic pain puts your brain in the headspace that this is a problem and it almost creates more pain. This is kind of what I'm picking up. You're extremely mm-hmm. right. Yeah, it it heightens the the anxiety, heightens the fear, heightens the the relevance. Um, as soon as you start to use really destructive language, so you need to be really careful with how you phrase things and what the narrative is around the pain. And so, yeah, it's something that I'm constantly trying to work on. Is why pain psychologists are so much better than I am. But it's it's definitely a tricky subject, especially if people say oh, you're just saying pain's all in my head. That's a very, very tricky thing to navigate because if you tell them, well, technically, yes, pain is in your head because all pain comes from the brain, as we know, and your brain's in your head. So that's why some people like to say pain, it's all in your head. But how people interpret that and how people receive that is they think I'm making it up. They think it doesn't exist, which is the total opposite if you try and educate them properly. That's why I I've, I don't use you know, it's all in your head. I don't use that language, but they often, people often hear it. Doctors often say it, surgeons often say it, and people just walk out of that treatment room like stomping the ground really angry because people think I'm making it up. And so, yeah, it's a very tricky conversation that you need to have and the narrative around it, the, the language that you use could be extremely powerful. So you need to be very careful with the words that you use. Yeah, Um so for you and your career, you know, starting you're, you're a physiotherapist and now you're really fascinated with like the the brain psychology and things like that as well. And I felt the same, like even with nutrition that I'm like, 
I just feel like it all comes back to the brain. And I feel like all these uh, science fields, like it just, it's all neuroscience in the end. Yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah. I, the Very further important. I get into my professional career and everything, I'm like, it's all about the brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is, it's very good to to start from there. And like, you know, if we can master our brain, we can master a lot of things. Oh. Uh. Yeah, for sure. For sure, Brody. Well, I'd love to hear a little bit more just about like your your business and how it operates Run Smarter Physiotherapy because you are, you know, based in Australia, but but you do work with people all across. You have online courses and stuff. Could you tell just our listeners a bit about like how, services you provide? Obviously, your podcast, free information everywhere, but just a little bit about like how specifically you can help because I'm sure there's a lot of runners listening to this that are in pain and need your help. Of course. Yeah. So, uh, the always number one go-to that I recommend for people just to confuse, just to not confuse them with too many things to do is to listen to the podcast, listen to the first 10 episodes, which cover the, the 10 universal principles to overcome and manage any injury. Have a listen to that first. Then if you try, if you're trying these things out yourself, because I, I do recognize the knowledge or the power of investing in your own knowledge and trying things out yourself and seeing if you make any inroads. But if you do need tailored assistance, I do offer online physio. So I am, we'll be changing maybe in a couple of months or start seeing people face to face. But for the last two or three years, I have been a strict only online physiotherapist that sees runners all over the world. And we do that through online consultations, through running assessments. People send me running videos. We discuss like a your injury diagnosis and management plan, running programs, strength programs, load management, like education. And that's a that's an option that people have. So they are we can include the the links in the show notes if they wanted to yeah. do that. I also offer a free a free injury chat if people want to book in on my calendar and find like a, a free 20 minutes if they want to have an injury chat to talk about their injuries and discuss if they want to do online physio, how it exactly works. Cause I do understand it's very new for people to understand like, how does that experience, how does that exchange actually work? And so I offer that to people, which we can include that as well. But yeah, I always, I always encourage people to have a listen to the podcast first because there might be some little things that you might realize like a revelation that changes a whole bunch in your running or your injury management and you could you could empower yourself to do it and so try that first and then if you do require additional assistance tailored assistance or just a chat about your injury that might need to require a few tweaks here and there then I'm available for an injury chat and if we need to go one step further and actually book for some form of consults, then we can chat about it then. Awesome. Yep. We will include all the links to get in touch with you in the show notes. And again, run, run smarter physiotherapy. Even if you just Google it, you're going to, you're going to probably land there, but we'll include all that. So Brody, I have a few uh, final questions for you. Just some fun questions. If, if you're want to play along, Sure, Brody, if there was one food that you could eat every single day for the rest of your life and never get sick of it, what would it be? Uh, so I have quite a sweet tooth. <laughs> you and me. Being on a, a nutrition <laughs> podcast, probably shouldn't be, I probably should have something a bit more sensible. But do you guys have Subway, the restaurant over in the US? Oh, yeah, yeah. Subway's there. Yeah. yeah. Subway cookies are my best sweet tooth <laughs> that I, I can just have all day. It's the number one food that I can keep eating if even if I'm sick of that food. I just end up yeah. just going back to the pack and eating another one. And so, look, the it would be hard to surpass that. Like if I had to choose something to have every day, I'd try something more nutritional. But if something, if there's something that I could eat every single day, it'd be Subway cookies. Yeah. Yep. I love how specific it is. It's not just cookies. It's the Subway cookies. Yeah, <laughs> they are good. It, they are no really idea. good. I don't know either, but I, I'm with you. There is something special about them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that, you have my, uh, glad that you're supporting my, um, my answer. Oh, of course. Yeah. And that that's the fun thing about that question is it's like, we, what could you never, ever, ever get? Like, I would get so sick of spinach. My gosh, yeah. no. <laughs> mm, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Awesome. How about um, your favorite sport to participate in yourself? Is it running? It'd have to be running or uh, running or triathlons. I have like, uh -huh. uh, I do participate in a couple of like sprint distance triathlons and I just have the best day on triathlon day as just like, yeah, a bundle full of energy. So either 
a trail run. Trail runs are like that sort of event. I absolutely love like the community is just amazing. Everyone's supporting each other. So either that or a triathlon, uh, uh, it'd be a close first and second. Yeah, that's awesome. How about as a spectator? Do you have a favorite spectator sport? Uh, anything that Australia is playing in, like uh, you probably don't know a lot about cricket, but I go to um, a cricket event once a year. It's our Boxing Day test match where you have 90,000, sometimes 100,000 fans in the crowd and we watch Australia um, versus England usually. And it's just a huge spectacle. So I could I could watch that all day. But it's probably a bit strange because I, I think a lot of North American uh, listeners probably wouldn't understand it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're familiar with it, but it's not part of our culture at all. Yeah. 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 Five but days cool. long. You can't, if something that's so good, you can always have more of it. And so test matches go for five days. And so it's, um, it's a good spectacle. Yeah. What an exciting event. Okay. Final question. For the Female Athlete Nutrition Podcast, is there a female athlete out there, a professional or a friend of yours, uh, someone in your personal life that you just find really inspiring and think is a role model? Role model, and who would that be, and why? I hope she listens to this. It's going to be my girlfriend. Uh, she, yeah. she, yeah, she's um, she has she's a runner. She does a lot of like yoga and a lot of swimming as well. She's very much honed in on her her healthy habits around like constant exercise and just constantly pushing herself with different challenges and fitness challenges. We're in the halfway through a plank challenge at the moment for the, for this month. And so, yeah, she constantly inspires me so that I'll have to lock in that answer. That's awesome. Couples who work out together, stay together. So agreed. (laughs) shout out to your girlfriend for being an inspirational female athlete and role model. And uh, Brody can't thank you enough for sharing all of your knowledge about injuries, running injuries, just taking care of ourselves. And um, thank you so much for your time today. It was my pleasure. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed that episode and thanks for listening. But before I let you go, I have free resources that you can have access to right away, right now, so that you can start fueling your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. First, I have your Red S recovery race. If you've ever wondered if you might be struggling with Red S, curious to learn more, or know you have Red S and are looking to recover fast, then you can head to www.riseupnutritionrun.com slash red S and download the red S recovery race. See how you place and figure out the next steps to recovery. Plus while there, I have a few other great resources for you, including three nutrition secrets that every elite athlete swears by and access to our private Facebook community, Female Athlete Nutrition. So again, to gain access to all of this, head to riseupnutritionrun.com slash red S, that's backslash R-E-D-S, and you can gain access and get the help you need fast. Too many girls and women and female athletes struggle with nutrition, but you don't have to any longer. Become fierce, fit, and fueled. Links in the show notes, and I'll see you next time.